Hey guys, welcome to me reacting to Game Theory, FNAF, your pain fuels us by the Game Theorists. Now, I'm guessing this is the continuation on the last Game Theory video, and yeah, uh, I think this is about the Stick Wraith, because the Stick Wraith is a thing, and apparently it could be like the new villain, or something like that, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't really read the books, but, uh, yeah, anyways, guys, originally in the description, make subscribe to the game, through your links, social description, right, so let's get right into it now. It's Matt Pat. It's alive! It's alive! It's a- What? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where t What? What was that intro? Or the timeline. <laughs> but not for the games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez, no, I hate myself, but not that much. Whew, I'll probably have to do that at some point down the line, but not today. No, what we're covering today is a different timeline. You see, there's a new monster afoot in the FNAF universe, a killer that has horrifically taken the lives of nearly a dozen people. A killer as yet unseen in the games, but one who will, after today's theory, provide us with key insights into how this whole FNAF universe- So this is the Stitch Wraith, right? Remnant, and how ghosts can possess Endo skeletons. Oh yeah, isn't Remnant, like, didn't FNAF AR have something to do with, like, Remnant or whatever? Security breach. But in order to know for sure, it's our job to track his movements, to understand what his goals are, and where he's headed to next. You see, last FNAF theory, we did a surface level analysis of 1.35 AM, the latest installment of the Fazbear Fright series. And boy was that one a biggie, with huge revelations about sister location, ultimate custom knight's vengeful spirit, and the real identity, or should I say identities, of Golden Freddy. And looking back, since the Fazbear Frights books became a thing, I've done five theories on them, covering the many, many connections that they have to the various facets of FNAF lore. From new strings of murders happening in 1985 to the true identity of psychic friend Fred Bear. But despite all of this new FNAF talk, there's been one element I've largely been glossing over, the Stitch Wraith. In the event that you haven't picked up any of the installments of the book series yet, let me catch you up. Each new book contains three short stories, right? That's the selling feature. It's what's advertised on the back of the box, so to speak, but each one also comes with a bit of a bonus. In reality, each book is more like three and a fifth stories. You see, each one ends with an epilogue, our little MCU post-credits teaser giving us a piece of yet another story, the tale of the Stitch Wraith, a story that appears to be- Wait, I didn't know they did that. They actually did that? New series, and that alone would be pretty darn cool, right? Those puzzle pieces do not fit together at all. It's buying more just to see the end of this thing. Slow clap, Scott Coffin. Slow clap. But three segments in and it's becoming clear that the tale of the Stitch Wraith isn't just another horror tale. It's instead a running thread throughout nearly every other shorter story that we've been reading through, which in turn seems to connect it both to the original trilogy of books as well as even the games. So in order to understand what this thing is and where the lore is headed, it's time to go easter egg hunting for a monster. Now admittedly, my first theory on the Fazbear Frights books briefly covered the Stitch Wraith, and uh, back then I assumed he was entered. The Wraith was described in that book as a mysterious figure wearing a black cloak and wearing a white mask with features drawn in thick black marker. The description specifically calls out his two eyes, one of which appears to be blacked out, a big toothy grin with blood around the mouth, and a limping or shambling walk. White mask, blacked out eye, shamble, shamble, shake, it seems like a slam dunk for Enter. However, the epilogue for 1.35am- Yeah, cause somebody said that, somebody I think told me that it wasn't Enter. 
nerd or something. How the Stitch Wraith was brought to life, a process that actually reveals a lot about how this series' mythos works. In this epilogue, we're introduced to Dr. Phineas Taggart, not to be confused with his friend Dr. Ferb Fletcher. Phineas is a bit of a mad scientist type. Study I had a feeling he'd make a Phineas and Ferb reference. Says himself, quote, Human emotion is slower to impact, more insidious. It emanates from us, or is excreted from us like sweat or tears, and it wafts outward like a noxious cloud soaking into the surroundings. In particular, his research is centered around the intense emotion of agony. In order to study it, we see that Phineas collects hundreds of haunted objects to search for this emotion trapped inside. Again from the book, the word haunted could mean showing signs of torment or some kind of mental anguish. These items on Phineas's shelves weren't possessed by ghosts. The ones that were truly haunted were energized by agony. Agony, I'm convinced, radiates farther from people than any other emotion, Phineas said. My work is focused on my hypothesis that you can take a saturation of agony, add any sort of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they'll combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. This, I believe, is what explains what people call haunted objects. And already you might be starting to see how this all ties into what we already know about this franchise. In oh, that's very odd. That is very odd, though. With agony, like, powers these things. In those blueprints, we learned about the mystery metal called Remnant, and its ability to supposedly give life to objects that it touches. The novel The Fourth Closet took it one step further and showed us the Remnant metal being created and used. In that story, we watch as William Afton melts down pieces of the old animatronics, creating a Remnant soup that he then uses to give life to new living robots, specifically the Funtime animatronics. Quote, On the heating table rested the endoskeletons of the original Freddy's animatronics, welded and melted together, immobile and featureless, and still inhabited by the spirits of the children who had been murdered inside of them so many years ago, still filled with life and motion and thought, all trapped, all in terrible pain. Usually this goes into something mechanical, something I made, William said. If we remember back to Candy Cadet's stories of five things always becoming one thing, five kittens getting sewn together, or five keys melted down into one, this is exactly what those stories were referring to. But Phineas's experiment in 135 AM actually take it one step further and give us more insight into the true nature of Remnant. Things that are brought to life via Remnant aren't necessarily infused with a soul, but instead with agony, with intense human emotion, with extreme human suffering. This is- Oh, okay. That's- that's very odd. In sister location, heck, even animatronics like Mangle don't necessarily need to have actual victims associated with them. We used to look at solving the mysteries of this series as having it be one to one. Yo, he's right. He's right. Because they don't, yeah, they never had, like, souls attached to them. So it was agony. Animatronics may contain multiple souls, like we talked about last time with Golden Freddy, and some might not contain any souls at all, as long as it always ties back to some extreme tragedy filled with this all-powerful emotion of agony. That rhymed, by the way. In place, let's go back to our story. We see Phineas collect objects associated with horrific tragedies, and via some means, funnel all the agony from them down into an endoskeleton, which we're specifically told is meant to be a stand-in for bones, so we're talking like a fanatic. FNAF 1 or FNAF 2 era endoskeleton here. Phineas then puts the head of a large three-foot doll on it. A doll whose description bears a shocking similarity to blank, actually, from the fan game Five Nights at- Wait, really? ...a battery pack before turning this beast on. And not only does this modern Frankenstein come to life, it immediately kills its creator, Phineas, seemingly by accident, surprisingly, and then runs off, hiding under a black cloak. Oh, so that's what that intro was. Why am I making such a big deal out of this thing? Why does this guy deserve his own episode? Well, because solving the Stitch Wraith story in these books is like a game unto itself. You see, there have been very subtle clues hidden throughout the nine other stories in this series that connect things back to the Stitch Wraith. My first clue was the battery pack Phineas uses to power the Stitch Wraith as he's building it. Because it's not just any battery pack. It came from Fetch, the murder animatronic dog from book two of the series. Quote, the item in the second box was 
was an animatronic dog that clearly no longer functioned. The dog was an ugly dog, with a triangle-shaped head and a wide mouth full of sharp teeth. In minutes, he'd revealed the dog's battery pack. So immediately we know that the Stitch Wraith's- Oh, okay. ...of the fetch story from book number two. So I dug around deeper and more connections kept coming. Earlier in this same book, in the title story 135 AM about the haunted Eladal, there's one line referencing a man named Phineas looking online for a particular toy. Quote again, one of the searches for special Eladal- Cause it's haunted- yeah, wait, cause it's haunted. It's a haunted toy. Who was trying to find one of the dolls. His ad referenced the special Ella doll and said he was willing to pay a premium for the doll's energy. Overall, across the nine stories published so far, seven seem to tie back to the Stitch Wraith, allowing us to create a rough timeline of events. So bear with me as we go through this. We know that 1.35 a.m. and Fetch must come first because Phineas is alive and looking for the Ella doll like I just mentioned, and the evil robot dog has just started his murder spree. From there comes the story we just covered, Epilogue 3 and the Stitch Wraith's creation. After that, he begins to roam the city collecting body parts for some purpose. You may remember book number one story to be beautiful, in which Baby hacks apart a human girl named Sarah in order to steal her identity. I remember that, yeah. Built out of junk, only for her to fall to pieces at the end. Well, in Epilogue number one, we hear that the Stitch Wraith was seen collecting those junk pieces of Sarah. Odd, right? And it's not the only time that it happens either. In book number two, there's the story Out of Stock, about a group of friends who steal a defective plush trap doll, one with oddly human-like eyes and teeth, only for it to go on a rampage. The boys manage to escape by luring it in front of an oncoming train where it gets shattered to pieces. And again, in epilogue number two, we see the Stitch Wraith on the scene, salvaging whatever he can find of the broken box. And that's where it would seem to end if it weren't for one other small detail. You see- So I'm guessing he's trying to put a- put together an army or something? Force-fed mini Rena dolls in the basement of Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals, there's a passing reference to a restaurant called The Snack Space. Hey man, I was picking up a takeout order at Luigi's the other night and saw your ex on a date with the manager of The Snack Space. Seems- Super unimportant, right? Well, it would be if this was the only time that it was mentioned, but it's popped up in one of the other stories. In Into the Pit, the very first story, the one about the time-traveling ball pit, the snack space is where the protagonist's father works, which means that Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rentals' sister location is also in that world, which in turn connects it to one final story, Count the Ways, where we see an old, broken, Funtime Freddy planning to execute a girl trapped inside of his stomach. And while these aren't necessarily directly tied to the Stitch Wraith, it certainly feels like at some point all of these stories will come together, as though we're working on chunks of a larger puzzle. We've got a big chunk over here, that's the Stitch Wraith connections, and a big chunk over here that's all connected through Sister Location and the Snack Space, and then you have a few other random pieces over here, and by the end I expect all of them will come together. So assuming that they are all connected, the timeline seems to go about like this. Lonely Fred the story about the kids getting mind swapped with mini Freddy dolls has to be first because it's the only one of these stories so far where Fazbear locations are open and ready for business. At some point, Freddy Fazbear's closes, leading to room for one more about the underground facility filled with mini arenas hoping to escape. Oh, okay, so he's kind of putting the stories together. Location. Due to the massive success and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender in children's entertainment. At some point, Baby and the Mini Renas escape from that underground facility, leading to 1.35 a.m. with Phineas looking for the haunted doll and Greg activating the murder dog in an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's in Fetch. From there, the next major moment is Stitch Wraith's creation in Epilogue 3, which then leads to his quest for body parts in To Be Beautiful Epilogue 1 and Out of Stock Epilogue 2. We also know that Into the Pit and The New Kid happen near the end of the timeline since they both feature a closed down, forgotten, or repurposed Freddy's building. Also, there's Count the Ways which is towards the end of this timeline grouped with these other stories since retired Funtime Freddy is just randomly sitting in a garage killing kids. What does all of this tell us? What was the purpose of doing all this work? Well, first, all of this seems to connect us pretty solidly into the book trilogy. The fact that we have an Ella doll infused with agony that Phineas wants his hands on perfectly matches the Ella doll that Henry made for his daughter Charlie. To quote from the fourth closet, agony erupted, flooding the room with its sound. A man lay curled on the floor 
floor, something cradled tightly in his arms, and when his mouth opened, the room shook with the sound of his anguish. Who is that? Charlie said anxiously. What is he holding? You don't recognize her? Elizabeth said. That's Ella, of course. It's all your father had left after you were taken. He cried over that cheap store-bought rag doll for two months, cried into it, bled into it, poured his grief over it. End quote. At which point, he makes the robotic Ella doll that we talked about in the last episode. So what we're seeing in these stories appears to be, at least to some extent, the aftermath of that trilogy of books. Which Oh, okay. We know the true identity of the Stitch Wraith. It's a bit of a long shot, but it's my personal headcanon until proven otherwise. I think that the endoskeleton that powers the Stitch Wraith, the main body that's become the conduit for all of this agony, is the same endoskeleton that killed Henry. The robot that he used to end his own life. The stabbing robot, which, let's be honest, is like the most complicated way to do that sort of thing. Like, wait, what? That's what? Creative types, man, they are weird. Anyway, we're told in the Silver Eyes that it's a basic Gen 1 endoskeleton with an unfinished face, which would explain exactly why Phineas needs to put a head on it. Quote from the Silver Eyes, she could see its face, if it could be called a face. Its feature- Wait, what? That was the, the endoskeleton? that he used because in FNAF World Update 2 he like committed suicide thing but its own grief so that was the actual animatronic not baby absolutely filled to the brim with agony I mean as far as endoskeletons go a murder bot built by a grieving father is a pretty huge deal and it's apparently an important enough character to this franchise to have also appeared at the end of the book trilogy when Charlie is being attacked by baby it's this same murder bot and it's trusty knife that Charlie uses to do them both in. I have a very, very strong theorist instinct that the Stitch Wraith will, at some point during this book series, be revealed to be connected back to Henry and his bizarre death. Just saying, the pieces are in place for us. Why? Just why did you jump scare me like that? Is connected a bit closer to the book trilogy, like it appears to be. We know that book five, Bunny Call, features a story about a man with gruesome burns over his body and an iron will to live. I mean, we already suspected that that was William Afton, but going back to see how his story ended in the fourth closet, we see that his death is far from certain. In his final moments, his hospital gown catches fire and he's pulled into a massive furnace. But then, nothing. No official confirmation that that burning actually kills him. Therefore, a burned man in a hospital who refuses to die sounds like a certain yellow bunny we all know who always comes back. Wait, what? Wait. What? Wait, what the heck? Okay. Um. Alright. So... I didn't know the purple guy was actually still alive. Uh, but yeah, honestly, this was actually a really good theory. I'm glad that he did a whole episode, like, just connecting the stories. I'm kind of glad that he just did a whole episode on that, because it's super obvious that he could make a whole episode on that, because he did. And honestly, it was, it was really good. I enjoyed it, because I like his theories for, like, what the Stitch Wraith could actually be. I do actually enjoy them. So, uh, yeah, honestly, I, I'd say this was actually a pretty good theory. It could be true, but it also could be false. But, uh, yeah, anyways, guys, leave a like and leave a comment. Channel. I'll see you in the next one. Bye! <laughs>